All right, we're going to start Revelation part 5 tonight. And we ended last week in chapter 2 of Revelation. And we were uh, dealing with the churches, the seven churches. And uh, we had started with uh, Thyatira last week before we ended. And the seven churches, if you look at a lot of your commentators or studies, it's just they'll take seven periods of the church, starting at 70 AD, going till now. And the churches represent every church, the different things all churches will go through, some of the struggles, some of the, the things they'll overcome, how they'll overcome. And if you study Revelation chapter 2 and 3, as far as the church, it gives a lot of insight to help the church to be what God has called it to be. And that's why in, in Revelation it says he talks about the past, the present, and the future. And in John's time, this was the present when John was talking about. It's the past, and then we're getting ready to go in the future and we get into chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. But we've got to uh, verse 24 of chapter 2 last week, and it was talking in 22 and 23, it was talking about this church had given over false doctrine. They had the, the woman Jezebel in it, and it, it allowed false doctrine, fornication, sin, idolatry uh, into the church, and they were claiming to be Christians, but doing a lot of other things. And he said in verse 22 and 23, he said, The whole devil cast her into a bed, and then they commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now you see, as you're going to see in every one of these churches, no matter how bad they were, God said He left an opening for each one of them to repent. Every one of them had the opportunity to repent. So what He's saying is it doesn't matter what the sin was, there's only one sin that's not forgivable, and there's none of you in here that can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that. When you study that, we'll get in that tonight when we look at Hebrews, but blaspheming the Holy Spirit is talking about somebody that's been saved, has been into where they're speaking in tongues, uh, they know the Holy Spirit, they've laid hands on the sick, they pray, they see miracles happen, they've moved in God's power mightily, and they turn their back on God and completely go one, you know, 180. And we've seen where pastors have done that over the years. This is where you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. But for any of you in here to worry about that, it's almost impossible. So as we get into that, the one thing I want you to see with each of these churches is Repentance. He, no matter what they've done, he always says repent. Jesus had left the way out, and that goes back to Second uh, Peter three nine. That you know he's uh, wants all men to come into repentance. He doesn't want any to perish. Jesus loves us that much, and that's what the Book of Revelation is just showing the church that no matter what his judgments are that are coming, the things that are coming, he has given us every way. To be taken off the earth. He has given us every opportunity to be taken out of the wrath to come. And we'll see that. Now starting at verse 24. It says, But unto you I say, and unto the rest of thy power, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none of the burden. Now, as far as the depths of Satan there, if you look at different commentaries, uh, what they were believing with Jezebel and some of the, the other occults they were believing, they believed in order to know the true grace and mercy of God that you had to know fulfillment of sin. You had to do all the sin you could do to know the grace of God. And that's not what Jesus talks about. Jesus said, if you love me, in John 14, 15, you'll obey my commandments, right? Or John yeah, 14, 15, he said, you'll obey my commandments. They were teaching just the opposite. And that's what they said the death of Satan was in order to experience Jesus. You had to experience sin, and that's wrong. You can't mix the two together. Now, if you see in verse 24, is there not a remnant there? He said to those that have not known the depths of Satan, there's a remnant. And in every church, no matter how bad the church was, there was always a remnant. Even back in the day of Elijah, when Elijah said, I don't want him to do anymore. I want you to just take my life. God said, but I have kept a remnant. God has always had his remnant. He always will have his remnant, those that are faithful and just to him. So he's saying here, even though this church was as bad as it was, there was a remnant there. Verse 25 said, but they which, are, uh, which ye have already hold fast, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. Now, 
hold fast is just basically to keep the works of Jesus. Obey His commandments. Do those things He told us to do. That's how we hold fast, is it not? You and I, if you think about it, we're holding fast every day. That's what we do as Christians. We hold fast. It says, we renew ourselves how often? Daily. How? Daily. daily. When it says we're to be renewed daily, you look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, we have to be transformed, renewed, but it's on a daily basis through the Word of God. And that's why you go back to Psalms 1, 1 through 3, and Joshua 1, 7, 8. It tells us that this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein how often? Day and night. Because God knew that as soon as you forgot the Word, you forgot Him. Now you say, how do you know that? How long had Moses been up on the mountain? When the people rebelled. 40 days. 40. 40 days. And the people rebelled. And they had his brother make them a golden idol so they could worship the God they worshipped in Egypt before they left. 40 days, they forgot God, and that's all it took to turn back to sin. So because we're human, God said it's a daily thing. Because when you forget, and it only takes a few days to forget, and you start doing wrong, it's easy to get into it. But God wants us out of that. He wants us to obey His commandments, do His works, do those things that are pleasing in His sight, and He wants us to be the light of the world. Matthew 6, or 5, 16, right? We're to be the light to the world. We're to let our light shine that men see our works. And we'll get into that in a little bit in James about what type of work we're talking about. But what He's talking to the church, and as we get into the church of Philadelphia here later on tonight, we need to have a works in our church. Too many churches have a light on, the doors open, people are in the church, but there's only one thing missing, that's Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of churches today that they have everything, the sign, the church, the steeple, but Jesus isn't there. We have to have Jesus in the church. And in order to have Jesus in the church, we have to do what he's called, and that's the works. We have to obey him, but also do the works he's called us to do. We have to let people see something there. You think about it. If you have nothing different than a sinner out in the world, why would they want to be like you? They already have what you have. There has to be something different. They have to see something in you they want. And that's what that light is. When they see something that you have that gives you a peace, that gives you a joy, no matter what the trials and temptations, and they see you overcome, they want it. They might not tell you, but when the time comes to them, they'll come to you and they'll ask you how you did it. And that will happen every time because they'll see that light in you. But this church, they had let sin come in, they had let false doctrine come in, and they were going down. And Jesus said, you need to hold fast on what you have. If you look at verse 26 there, and 27, and he that overcometh, and keep of my works unto the end, to him will I give power over nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken, to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Now to every church, if you look at all seven churches, he said to those that overcome, and everything is promised to all seven churches of the kingdom of God. It's promised in some different way, shape, or form, some blessing or, 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 or gift that we receive as we get into heaven, but heaven, eternal life, is promised to all overcomers. You say, how do I get to heaven? People say, you have to go to church. I'm going to tell you today, when the rapture happens, there's going to be a lot of churches that will be half full, a quarter full, some may even be all the way full. Just going to church will not get you to heaven. I'm telling you that today. You have to overcome it. In order to overcome, you have to know your word, you have to study your word, you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way to overcome. How many people, even in this church, have you seen going through trials and tribulations and you've seen such a peace on them? You know where peace comes from? Jesus Christ. No other thing will give you that peace to overcome. And that's what we have to have. He promises us that when we walk with Him, when we do what He's told us to do, and honor Him that we will all be overcome. And it's through Jesus Christ. You look at 1-7, Revelation 1-7, when it's talking here in, in 2-27 about rule and reign. Revelation 1-7 told us that. 
It said, Behold, he cometh with a uh, cloud, and every uh, eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth, and wail because of, uh, of him, even so. And verse 6 is what I actually want to see. And he hath made you and I, us, kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever. You and I are kings and priests. Now, what's that mean? Look at Revelation 20, verse 4. Look at Revelation 20, verse 4. Revelation 20, verse 4. It says, And I saw thrones, and they that sit upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Who were on the thrones? You and I, kings and priests. We're the ones that come back in Revelation 19, verse 11, when the uh, window of heaven was open. Jesus came back, and the saints riding on the white horses. That's you and I. That's the raptured church. That's who that is. We're going to come back, and we will be kings and priests. There is a second rapture in Revelation 7, 9. They will be those that wait upon God at, at the throne. Well, you and I, in the first rapture, we will be kings and priests. We will rule the nations. If you look at uh, verse 12, that same uh, Revelation 20, look at 11 and 12. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, whose face uh, the earth and the heaven fled away, and they were found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the book was open. Another book was opened, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. You and I will not be standing before God. You and I will be sitting beside Him, ruling and judging. We will be rulers, we will be judges. Now you say, what do you mean by that? Go to 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six verse two. What we have to realize is you and I are not here during tribulation. We're in heaven. You and I will come back and we will rule and reign, as it told us, with Jesus Christ. We will rule the nations. We will be judges, and we will not have to answer before God because those who are raptured out have already repented and asked forgiveness. And the Bible says, if He's forgiven you, He remembers no more. There's nothing for you to answer for. That church, rapture right church. Yes, ma'am. In that uh, verse where it says the books, there was books open. Were they books. Judged the dead, but there was only one book open for those that are already judged in that book. Yeah. The book of life. The book of life. And if your name is found in the book of life, those of us that went out prior to the rapture, we're already seen in heaven. Those that will be before the throne are those that go through the millennial reign. At the end of the millennial reign, when God destroys those that have come against Jerusalem the second time, in the second Armageddon, there will be the white throne of judgment, and you will have those that were saved through that time will stand before Him. They will get eternal life, and you'll have those that were not saved plus the dead. And if you look at Revelation 20, I'm oh, sorry, We'll go back to Revelation 20. Look at 1 Corinthians, where you were, 6-2. It says, Do ye not know that the saints, that's you and I, shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matter? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? You and I are not before God in judgment. When we're raptured out, we become kings and priests. We receive crowns. We will not be judged because we have been faithful and just on earth. And through our faithful and justice and our repentance, we are given what he said we will be, kings and priests. If you go back to Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, I think we hit this last week or the week prior to that. It's talking about the dead at the white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 5 and 6. Verse 4 at the end said, And they lived in the reign of Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, in verse 5 of Revelation 20, those are those that died from the time of Adam and Eve until the rapture. 
that did not know Jesus the Lord and Savior. Those are the ones that died in sin. It said, but the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand year reign was finished. This is the first resurrection. You and I will be in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's you and I. And then we see that the dead, in verse 12, we just talked about that, those are those that died spiritually, they'll be brought up to be judged and cast in the lake of fire. There is a second death. Born once, die twice. Born twice, you die once. We will all, unless we get raptured out, we will all physically die. Unless we are here with the rapture. But we do not have to die the second death. That's our personal choice. If we choose Jesus Christ, we will see no second death. We will be kings and priests. Now, I won't get into that tonight because we'll get into that later in Revelation, but if you look at Revelation 20, there's people for a thousand years. And there's people that will have children. And the population will grow. If you look at Revelation 21, there are people that enter into the kingdom of God in eternity. Just like Adam and Eve were supposed to be. They are humans that will live forever. And you say, well, what's a tree of life for? It's for the nations who eat of it for their health and to continue to live for eternity. Adam and Eve were put on earth. They were to live forever. Right? And they were flesh and blood. There will be people that will live forever. You and I will be immortal. We will be like the angels. We will have no time constraint. We can go anywhere we want in the universe. But there will be people that are the nations outside of the New Jerusalem that will come into the New Jerusalem to worship God, to eat of the tree of life, and they will live forever because they have eternal life also. But they will also be able to have children because it says the nation, and the nation will grow and multiply, and you and I will be kings and priests. When we get into that, we'll study that more and we'll give you more scripture on that, but there will continue to go. Now, the Bible says there will be no husbands and wife in heaven. That's you and I, the ones that are raptured out. When we're raptured out, we'll know who they are, but we are going to be an immortal spirit being. There will be no need for that. We'll be with Jesus Christ. He will be our husband and our wife. And that's all we'll want to live for. I was thinking the other day, I hear people that they don't want to lift their hands and praise God, and they don't want to sing, and they don't want to give God glory. And I got to thinking, you better get used to it now, because if you go to heaven, that's what you're going to be doing the rest of it, your eternal life, is praising God. It's, we need to get used to it now. If you think about everyone that has ever died, the book you read, and gone to heaven and come back, Every one of them have said it that they were praised and sang and worshipped God constantly. But it was a joy. There was a peace with it. So if you're not singing and praising, you will be. Alright? So you might as well get used to it now. Any questions so far? Alright, back to Revelation chapter 2. Verse 28 and 29. And I will give him the morning star. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. What is the morning star? Jesus. Revelation 22, 14 through 16 tells us exactly who the morning star is. Revelation 22, starting at 14, said, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. It says, For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. That's Jesus Christ. And he backs it up with the scripture so you know exactly who the morning star is. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, I said that last week, it's not God flee from it. If there's something you have any doubt when you're doing it, if God would not like it, if you've got a doubt, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you most often. 
leave it alone. If there's any doubt, it's probably wrong. So go with your first senses. And as far as churches, when we're looking at these churches, there is no such thing as a perfect church. I have seen people over the years go from one church to another church to another church to another church because they don't like what this church and this church and this church and this church and this church did. Get over it. Because you're never going to find a church that does everything that will make you happy. Nope. We're not all the same. We're all made different in the eyes of God. No church is perfect. There's only one perfect man. So get in a church that preaches the Word of God, a church that you feel comfortable in, and you work at being happy in that church. But you're never going to find a perfect church. And people will say, well, do I have to go to church? Well, if you look at Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, you know, you don't have to go to church. I know people that are homebound that get church at home and people take communion to them. But in Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 23, Hebrews 10, 23, it said, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another provoked unto love and to good works. And that word provoke just means to stir up. That if you see somebody that may not be doing, get behind them. Encourage them. Lift them up. Give them some edification. That's what the church is for. It says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Who is the church? We are. Yeah. We are. The people say, well, I don't need church. We are the church. We need one another. How many of you have ever been lifted up and edified by somebody in the church? Oh, yeah. That's what the church is there for. We all have down days. You know, when you come in, and there's times I come in and I said something to somebody and they've just broken out crying and I put my arms around them. I didn't know to say that. It's just like the Holy Spirit had me say that, but it broke the ice. That's what we're there for. We are the church. And when you stay at home and say, well, I don't need a church, you're fooling yourself. Because after a while, the world slips in. Church is where you come to fellowship with people who believe the same as you do and to come for education, to be built up, to learn. So it is necessary. I have seen some people that have tried to do it, but most of those, if you watch people who sit out of church long enough, watch the fruits, you'll see things change. You need the like believers. You need the like. Why do you think alcoholics go to a tavern? Because most everybody in the center is alcoholics. They go to like people. It's that's what they hang around the people that are like them because they can that way they can associate. Christians should hang out with Christians. Amen. Yeah. All right. Any questions on the church of five All right. Revelation chapter three. And we're going to start. This is Sardis. And this is a dying church. This is the only church that Satan was able to take down. Uh, we talked about the churches uh, going through being seven different periods. This church would be the one that would be through the Reformation period, if you want to say. It's a church where if you belong to such and such country, you were in that church. And if you didn't belong to that church, you couldn't open your business up, you couldn't buy, you couldn't sell because you weren't a church member. Now, in most cases, they didn't know Jesus. They belonged to a church. They were religious, but they didn't know Jesus Christ. And we've seen that over the centuries. If you study nations, they had where you had to be part of a certain church or you couldn't do anything. And a lot of times, those churches, the people that ran the churches were worse than the thieves themselves that were outside because they bribed, they extorted, they took money. So this represents a period where they were religious, but they never knew Jesus. And I'm telling you, there are a lot of people in the world today, they said, well, I'm religious. We can all be religious. A Satanist is religious. You know? A New Ager is religious. Somebody that fishes seven days a week is religious. It, it just depends. You can be religious, but do you know Jesus Christ? Our religion, as far as Christianity, is a personal relationship, and this church 
did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It was a dying church. Now, to give you a little background, this was a, a carpet center, if you want to say. They made carpets there. They made tapestries. And it was a wealthy city. So if we look at this, and when we get to the Laodicean church, they were a wealthy city too, and that's the one that Jesus wanted to spew out of his mouth. They depended upon their wealth. They depended upon them themselves. Okay? They didn't look to Jesus for what they needed. They depended upon everything they had to get them through, and that's what they were doing wrong. Uh, look at verse 1. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. What if Jesus told us at our church about? He said, you got a name in your church, but you're dead. That's what Jesus told him. He said, you're dead. And that's pretty bad when the church is told that. This church had a sign out. I think we talked about last week at one of the other churches. It said, come and worship with us on Sunday. They had a sign out, but Jesus wasn't there. This church had the lights on, the people were there, but Jesus was not there. And that's pretty sad if you are a church professing to be a Christian church, but you don't even know Jesus Christ. That is the church. We are the church in Jesus. So this church didn't even know Jesus. They were doing a lot of things, but what they were doing was wrong. Outside this church looked good, but inside they were spiritually dead. Alright? Now, go to 2 Timothy 3 if you would. You think about today, we got a lot of churches today that have a lot of programs, they've got a lot of activities, they got a lot of things going on, but spiritually they're dead. If you look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. It said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men should be lovers of their own self, covenant boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontition, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, this is what I want you to see, verse 5. Having the form, or a form, of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. It's easy to say you know God. If you go to the book of James, it said even the devil said they know God, and they fear him. Knowing God doesn't mean anything. God says, if you want to know me, you've got to know my son. If you look at 1 John and read 1 John 1 2, the, the books of 1 John, it tells you in there, if you don't know my son, you don't know me. God says, the only way you can know me is through my son because he is me. And if you can't know him, it's impossible to know me. So this church did not know Jesus at all. All right, look at verse 2. If you look at each of these churches, he says some of these churches that they understand and where they're at. It said, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found my works perfect before God. Now, this city where this church was in Sardis, when he says be watchful, two times in the past, and if you want the dates, it was 549 B.C. and 218 B.C., this church had one gate where, or this city had one gate where you could come in. And they had a guard watching around the clock. Two times in history, the guard fell asleep and wasn't watching the city, and the city was taken. That's when he says, be watchful. He's going back to the history of the city, something they understand that happened to them when they weren't watchful, and he's saying, if you're not watchful, this thing will happen to you also. Yeah. So he uses something that, that people of that city knew from the history of their city to tell them, do what I say, because if you don't, you're going to fall. All right, verse 3. And we're going to spend just a little bit of time here on verse 3 couple verses. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and what? 
repent. Remember I said one word he used to all seven churches? He told them repentance. Now, you had two that there was no condemnation, so they didn't have to. But repentance, it doesn't matter how bad it is, there is salvation. That's what we have to realize. We, we see people who say, they're going to hell. They are right now. But everybody can come to Jesus Christ. Everybody has that opportunity. And you and I have that opportunity to help. Now, we can't save anybody. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But what you and I do is pray for them. And we can lose the spirit of adoption. Okay, we see that in Romans 8, 14. We can lose the spirit of adoption upon someone. That is a spirit. What's that spirit do? It convicts them. How did you and I get saved? Convicted by the Spirit. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So we can lose the Spirit of God and pray for family members and friends and neighbors and co-workers that they would be convicted and brought into the kingdom of God. And you know, you may never see them being saved. They may move away. It may be 20 years after you pass away. But God will be faithful and just to that prayer. Amen. Pray that they're saved before the rapture. And that the family members come to know Jesus Christ, that they do not get left behind. God is faithful and just to that prayer. He will start sending people in front of them. He will send people to them. I know when I was out running, uh, Dave Dixon, he was our youth minister here. He worked where I did. And for four years, this guy came to me. Would you want to go to church with me today? Would you want to church me tonight? How about Sunday? Every time I seen him come, I knew what he was going to ask. And I wasn't saved then. And when Dave Dixon comes, I'm like, here we go again. And one day he asked me, and I was in a local one. And I said, sure. And you know what happened? I got saved. So, pray. Amen. Everybody can be saved. It's out there. But God will put people in your path. Whether you like it or not. Those that aren't saved, He'll put people in your path. And He'll, he'll keep reminding you, I'm here. I'm here. And He will do that. But if you look at the rest of verse 3 said, Repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come with a, to thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, I'm going to give you three scriptures here again. Look at Luke 21. Luke 21. And these will confirm what he's saying here. I'm going to read verses 32 through 36. Luke 21, 32 through 36. Luke 21, 32 through 36. It says, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with uh, suffering or Indulgence is what that word means. Uh, and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so is the day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What's he talking about there? The rapture, is he not? Yeah. Talk about the rapture that you would be worthy to stand before the Son of Man and not have to go through the judgments of the world, the judgments of the tribulation period. <coughs> so, this lines up with what it's saying. Look at Matthew. Matthew 25. I think this is probably one of the best scriptures that relates to the tribulation, or the rapture of the tribulation. Matthew 25. Verses 1 through 13. It's talking about the story of the ten virgins. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. These were, quote, religious. People. They have religion, but the oil, they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know the Holy Spirit. But the wise took oil and their vessels with their lamps. These were those that were true to Jesus Christ. 
that knew his word and obeyed his commandments, that listened to the Holy Spirit. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry, They behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them and sell, and buy for yourselves. Bible tells us that each one of us have to work out our own salvation. That's what it's saying there. The five said, we can't. You have to find out on your own. The only way you can get into the kingdom of God is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We can't help you do that. We can show you how, but you have to do it. That's what they're telling them there. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were ready, uh, that were ready, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying unto the Lord, Open to us. But he answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now I want you to see something in verse 10 there. The very last thing is the door was shut, right? Look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. When we get to chapter 4, this is the rapture. In verse 1 it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. That's the door that was open when Jesus comes to take his church, and when he leaves, the door is shut. Those that did not know him cannot enter in, because he has taken his true church. Those will be left behind for at least three and a half years of the tribulation until that second rapture, and pray that they get saved during that time. There is a door in heaven. That door Jesus will come through to rapture his church. It is shut in Matthew 25 there to those that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we have to always be ready, always be prepared that we are ready for Jesus Christ at all times. Questions, comments? Okay. All right, back to Revelation 2. Or 3, I mean. Look at verse 4. <coughs> it says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. What we talked about in the church of uh, Thyatira, there was still, what, a remnant? Here in the dying church, there's what? A remnant. And I want you to see some. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Look at verse uh, 7, 8, and 9. Revelation 19, 7, 8, and 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine, clean linen, or fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now hold your place there. He just said in, back in Revelation 3, 4, that they, those that were not defiled with their garments, they shall walk with him in white. Fine, clean linens. And it goes on to say in verse 8, or verse 9, guess what you get to do when you're raptured out? And he saith unto me, right blessed are they which are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. And he saith unto me, these are the true saying of God. You and I will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because we will be in fine white linen. That white linen represents the saints of God. When we get to chapter 4, we'll spend some more time on the white linen and the crowns and who the saints are, but that's us. That's you and I. We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You think you've been to a feast on this earth? You ain't been to nothing yet. Amen. You think you've eaten some of the richest pie on this earth? You ain't ate nothing yet. Wait till you get to the feast of the Lamb. It's going to be great. And you and I will be there. Alright, back to Revelation 3, 5 and 6. 
Jim. Yes. I heard the preacher say recently, this is a fun, fun thing, that probably that supper would have um, um, the fried chicken from, what's the place that just sings? <laughs> oh, Beeler's, Gabe's? No, no. Chick-fil-A. Oh, Chick Fil A. Oh, yeah. would probably have a fried chicken for the Chick Fil A. I hope heaven has got fried chicken. That's my favorite food. <laughs> <laughs> fried chicken and taters. They gotta have that. <laughs> All right. Brother Steve. Yeah. 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 Verse five and six. He that overcometh again. Every church, God tells him, he that overcometh. And here's another thing that's promised: the same should be clothed in white raiment. We just saw that. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. There's a controversy here, is there not? If those churches that say that once saved, always saved, once baptized, always baptized, how can you have your name blotted out of the book of life? Your name's put in the book of the life upon salvation. When you become a child of God, your name's put in the book of life, Right? How can your name be taken out of the life if once saved, always saved? Falling away. There is a way to fall away. The thing with the once saved, always saved is wrong. That's right. You can fall from the grace of God. And we'll give you two scriptures. Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. I'm going to do verse 3 through 6 of Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, 3 through 6. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, this is not talking about somebody that is a Christian, is on fire for God, speaks in tongues, lays hands on the sick, has read and studied the word, and then slips and falls. Because what's the word say in 1 John 1 9? He is faithful and just to forgive all that ask repentance. So we do slip and fall. This is talking about what I said earlier somebody that has completely turned their back on Jesus Christ, knowing who he is, the power of the Lord, the power of the Spirit, and has turned away completely and just denied him. That's what this is talking about. And it can happen. If you look at Revelation 20, verse 15. Revelation 20, verse 15. Here's what happens if your name is taken out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation 20, 15. And whosoever was not found written in the Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever was not written in the book of fire, the Lamb's book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Back to Revelation chapter 3. Verse 5. If he overcometh, I will not blot out his name out of the Lamb's book of life. So it is possible to fall from salvation. Although it's rather hard to do, it is possible if you turn your back on Jesus Christ after knowing. Now I'm not talking about someone that gets saved, hallelujah, they're on fire, and two weeks later they're back in the bar. And then a month later they get saved again. They didn't have a true commitment. I'm talking someone that has spent years with God. And for those of you, there's a book out there called The Divine Revelation of Hell by Mary Kay Baxter. If you read about it, she talks about going into a special place in hell where there was pastors and teachers of the word that had taught and been pastors and TV evangelists and fell from the Word of God and had passed away and they were in hell. Right. 
There are men that will fall, and women. So it can be done. It's not going to be easy, but it can. Now, he tells us exactly what he's saying in verse 5. The first three words there in verse 5 of Revelation 3. What's it say? If they overcome. To him that overcome. Revelation 2.7 says to him that overcome. Revelation 2.17 says to him that overcome. Revelation uh, 2.26 to him that overcome. Revelation 3.12 to him that overcome. Revelation 3.21 to him that overcome. All seven churches, it was said to him that overcometh in uh, eternity, heaven, the glory of God is promised to every one of them. We have to become overcomers. We have to be what it tells in, in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. We have to be renewed. We have to be translated. We have to do it daily. It has to be a daily sacrifice. Living in Jesus Christ is not confessing your sins, receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, and living your life of hell. It's dying daily to God. It's giving up the things that we've done all our life that are wrong to live right with Christ. And we have to do that. And he teaches us all through the Old Testament. That's what's taught, that we have to die with Christ. It's a daily thing. Because you can't give a lot of those things up overnight. It takes time. But you and I, our walk with Christ is a daily thing until the day we die or the rapture happens. It's the only way we can do it. Now, I've got one question to, to those out listening on this. If they don't believe that the once saved, always saved theory, would it be worth the risk to take that chance? No way. If there was one chance in a million, that, that's right. Would you even take that chance? No. It, it, the word says it is, but you know a lot of people say, "Well, I don't believe that." Well, you can believe what you want. Uh, you don't have to turn there. But Romans ten, thirty two and thirty three says, "Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven." When you completely turn from God after knowing Him, what are you doing? We're denying Him, are you not? Scripture says, if you deny Him, He will deny you. Those of you that are writing it down, it's Matthew 10, 32 through 33. You said Rome. What did I say? Rome. Rome. Matthew. So to say, it would be pretty hard. Forgive me. Matthew 10, 32 through 33. I was thinking Romans, but it was Matthew. But yeah. you know that, as a human being, I mean, it's, so much happens to you. Mm -hmm. Divorces, illness, death, failure in your work. Mm -hmm. And you'll find this millions of people just, just lost the face after that. They just yeah. went berserk and turned out to be alcoholics and everything else. Yeah. Most of them are. That's what they do, you know. That's what I call a car. A lot of the times you'll see. And I'm going to try to put this with understanding, is a lot of churches and even pastors will say that when you're saved, your life will be rosy from now on out. Oh, the Bible says that all that love Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. Yes, sir. We will all have trials and temptations. Seven, ten, three, nine, three, sure. But what's going to happen, what you just said, Marvin, those that truly didn't know Jesus, when the, the trials and tribulations came, they found no peace. They blamed God. Right. We will go through things, and I'm going to tell you now, I have personally myself said, God, what is going on? What is happening in my life? We've all said that. We've questioned God. Why am I going through this? Have we not? But God said... He will pull us out of all of them. He says He will give us a peace that passes all understanding. He will give us a joy that comes from the Lord. And there again, that's what I was talking about earlier, that light that shines. That's when people see bad things happen in your life that they turn the bottle of drugs to and the same thing happens to you and you're going around bouncing and smiling and singing and everyone, are you nuts or what? And as Joe said, he is, but he screwed on the right pole. <laughs> but they'll see that. When they see you going through the same thing they've gone through, and they turn to alcohol or drugs or, or something 
to try and find peace, and you have that peace, they're going to come to you and say, why are you so happy? Where do you find that peace? And that's where you have to be a light, and that's the door that you can talk about Jesus Christ. And I'm not telling you to go out and rosy life. There will be times in your life that you're going to question God. You're going to question what His Word said and why this is happening. But He will give you a peace. Amen. He will bring you through it. Now, I don't want to tell you to pray for patience because I never pray for patience. No. I'll tell you, if you ever pray for patience, you will get tried. So, you know, I'll, tell, I'll never pay for patience, pray for patience. But things, if you look back, when we go through hardship, trials, tribulation, persecutions of the time, they're tough. They bring you down to your knees sometimes. You want to cry. You don't understand. But later on, you look back and you go, wow, look where I've grown from that. Look where I'm at now. And it took that, maybe, you know how those of you that have worked out or done exercise, you know, you'll do and do and do and you'll, you'll go and you hit a plateau. And it takes something else to move up to the next level. We get to that in our Christian walk. We hit a plateau. And things will happen in our life that we want to blame God. But if we look back, it was allowed to happen to move us up to the next plateau. And God will let those things happen. But you go to Romans 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, it says that we grow from that. Our patience, our hope, our love all comes from that. And that's what God's talking about. All right. Well, we get to verse 6 back in verse, uh, chapter 3. And he that hath near, let him hear what the Spirit says the, to the church. Again, we have to listen to the Holy Spirit. He leads us, He will guide us, He will direct us. All right. Verse 7 is the church of Philadelphia. This was known as the Loyal Church. And for those of you who want to put the time frame, a lot of the commentators say about the 17th century till the rapture. We're in that now. We're in the church of Philadelphia. Okay? This was the Loyal Church. This was a church. It was a mission church. It was a word church. It was a church alive. What's our sign say out there? The church alive is worth the drive. Amen. This is the church that everything was turning. All the wheels were turning. All the pistons were on fire. All the spark plugs were hitting right. They were doing what God called them to do. Now, for those of you who like me that like history, Philadelphia, if you look at it in Greek, it just means brotherly love. All right? And it had a lot of uh, Greek influence at that time, but Attilus II, he was a king of Philadelphia, and his brother uh, Eumenes, he was a king of Pergamon, or Pergamus, where the other church was, and he named it after his brother because he loved him so much. That, that was brotherly love. So it was named after that for the background of those of you like history. Satan could not destroy this church no matter how hard he tried. Satan could not get a foothold in this church no matter how hard he tried. The other five churches out of the seven, Satan got a foothold in. One of them he actually destroyed. This church, Satan could not get in because they did not allow him to get in. They stood on the word. And that's, this is the church that we need to be molded after. This is the church that he wanted us to be. Philadelphia and Smyrna. We talked about Smyrna in chapter 2. It's the only two churches that had no condemnation. Everything God talked about them was good. They were commended for everything they did. If we look at the description of Christ here in verse 1, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these things said, He that is holy, he that is true, he that hath a key of David, he that openeth, no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Every description we see when it's talking to the angel, <coughs> Jesus, he describes himself that we see in the description in chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 18, or verse 14 through 18 of the description to him. We see that same description. And we see that so it lets us know who is telling the churches this. It's Jesus Christ is the one telling the churches all this. Now, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Remember we talked about a set of keys? I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. And I have the keys to hell and death. Now we see another set of keys here. 
he that is true and hath the key of David. You might know what that name means, the key of David. What did Jesus come out of? What line? David. What was David's line? It was a kingly line, was it not? So we have a key here, or the key to his authority, or the key to his kingliness, if you want to say. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Chapter Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. Daniel even spoke of his kingly authority back in Daniel 7. <coughs> Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. You've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Daniel 7, 13 through 14. It said, I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, come with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him what? Dominion. Dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him in dominion of an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. When we get to Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, we're talking about a scroll that was handed with the seven seals on it, and it's handed, and the Lamb takes it. That scroll is what we're talking about there. It is the divine ownership of the world. It is His authority. He's handed after the rapture. He comes back with the church. He's seated in heaven. God hands His Son, as we just saw, His Son's brought before the throne, the scroll with seven seals on it. Jesus gets up out of his throne of grace. He comes to an open door. He raptures the church. He comes back. The door is closed. In Revelation 5, you see him standing in verse 4 and 5 before God, which is what Daniel here in verse or chapter 7, 13 and 14 is giving us that description for, that scroll with the seven seals that handed him, and that is his kingly authority. That is his title deed if you want to say to the world and that's what we're seeing here who Jesus is that key of David is that kingly authority it's the ownership of the world he owns the world it's his now as far as the window uh, back in Revelation as far as the uh, uh, door that no man shutteth and openeth that he does if you go to Isaiah 22 2 Isaiah 22, 22, and Isaiah 9, 6. Both these scriptures show where that came from. Isaiah 9, 6. Is one a lot of you will know. We hear that around Christmas time. And this is back to his kingly authority who he is. Isaiah 9, 6. says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, the rule, the reign, the authority, government, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is the King. That key that we're talking about, he's given of David, is his kingly authority. Isaiah 22, 22 talks about the door. Isaiah 22, 22 talks about the key in the door. Isaiah 22, 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. This is the key we were just talking about. So he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open. Remember I told you that if you look at a scripture in the Bible, God will back it up somewhere else with another scripture. For out of the mouth of two or three shall everything be verified. 
God gives it in two or three to where He confirms His Word what He's saying. Now, what does Matthew 28, 18 say? It says, And all power is given Him what? In heaven and earth. In heaven and earth. That means He has power over everything. What's, go to Matthew 16, 19. Matthew 16, 19. All power in heaven and earth is given to Jesus. And you know what? If He has every key there is to have, Jesus has it. You look at Matthew 16, 19, you say, well, I'm having a bad day. Well, my job did this. Well, my boss did that. Well, my neighbor did that. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give unto thee the keys. Jesus owns them all. So he's given you the keys. He's turning power and authority over to you of the he of kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, thou shalt be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, thou shalt loose in heaven. Jesus has all power and authority in heaven and earth. Satan has limited power on earth. Jesus has given you and I the keys to heaven. John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall you do also, and greater than he shall you, we do, because he goes unto the Father. He transferred that power to you and I. When he passed away, that power was given to his church. It goes back to Daniel 2, 36. The stone that was cut out of our hands was Jesus Christ. When he transferred that power, it became a mountain. When that power was transferred to you and I, we are the church. Jesus works through us. You and I, we have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He gave them to us. He has them. They're His. He gave them to us. That we have that same authority. Whatever we loose. In Jesus' name, I loose warring angels around my house right now. It's done in heaven. Whatever you bind. Right now in Jesus' name, Satan, I bind you. I come against you and your works, your demonic spirits, your demonic forces, and I break them off. Me and my household, I bind them now. It's done in heaven. That's what he's talking about. The power is in what? It's in your mouth. It's in your spoken word. You have to speak it. God has given us power. He has a kingly authority. You and I have a kingly authority. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought you had a question. You and I have the kingly authority. We have to use it. We have to use it. How many times have you all something and you, and, and you went about the hard way and went, wow, I got such and such, I could have used that. If we use the right tool, it makes it easy. Too many times we don't use what God has given us, our mouth. We use it, but we don't use it for the right way. Amen. Okay? We don't use it the way God says to use it. He says bind. He says loose. We to speak. We're to use the authority given to uh, Him, which He has transferred to you and I, the church, the rock to the King of Mountain. Which is that kingly authority that you and I have. Got a little more time here. Uh what we get to, verse 7, it talks about Jesus being a door. <clears throat> John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 9. When it talks about it, it's also back up because Jesus even used the term himself. John chapter 10, verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pastor. Jesus is the door. When we see what we're reading in Revelation, it ties into almost every book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. You go back and you find scripture after scripture after scripture that confirms what God's word is saying, that backs up or supports what his word is saying. And that's why it's so important that when we study the Bible, we have to know the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation supports the entire Bible. It brings them all together. Now, if you look at verse 8, back in Revelation 3, verse 8. 
I know thy works. Behold, I set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. This church did not conform to anything that did not line up with the Word of God. This is the church we want to be today. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, we don't accept it. We cannot become politically correct. That's what's happened to the church today. The church has tried to become politically correct to make everybody happy. I'm sorry, but if the Word of God says it's sin, I don't care what you wrap it in, how many bows you put on it, it's still sin. I don't care how many laws you pass to say it's okay to do, if God says it's sin, it's still sin. Amen. You can change everything you want, but it does not change the Word of God. Amen. What's the Word say? Let every man be what? A liar? liar. Yep. Because God is the only truth there is. We have to conform to God's Word. If God says it's a sin, I don't care what man's telling you. It is a sin. Period. You can make any law you want. It does not change God's law. It is still sin. And we have to make sure of that. Now, the term here they're using in verse 8, this church had a little strength. And it sounds like they didn't have much, but if you look that up in Greek, it's dunamon or dunamis. That word little and strength. You know what the miraculous working power? That's dunamis. That's dunamis. It's the same thing. The little strength they had was miraculous strength. It was miracle working strength. They didn't need but a little bit of it. That's all they needed. You take our word today, dynamite. It is derived from these two words in Greek. This was a dynamic church. It was a little dynamite church. It might have been a small church, but it was a power cave. And it has the power of God in it. And he's telling us that through how this church operated. This church, it, they had an open door. And if you think of what it said with the open door there in verse 8, I sit before the open door. You think about it, if you have the knowledge of God, if you have an understanding of God, what is every church to be? A mission church, are they not? A church to reach out while the door is open. God opens doors at times where we can step through and where we can witness to others. This church had that door open because they were a witness church. They were a mission church. The Word, they were a testifying church. They preached the Word of God. They had vision. Anybody know what Proverbs 29, 18 says? Without vision, what? The people perish. perish. That's what he's talking about. If the church does not have a vision, well, I mean, if the church has no idea where it's going, if they have no idea who they are, that church will perish. You have to know who you are in Jesus Christ. You have to know where you're going. Right here is the road map that tells you where you're going. When you get a vision in the Bible, when you get the vision from this, you'll not perish. You'll have everything you need right there. Alright. Verse 8 also says, I know thy works. Look at James, if you would. Just go back a few books to the book of James. And we'll, we'll wrap up tonight after this. The book of James, chapter 2. Now, the Bible tells us why you're looking in Ephesians that we're not saved by works, right? We're saved by grace. There's nothing you and I can do on this earth to be saved except accepting Jesus our Lord and Savior and then being saved by His grace. But there's now a works after we're saved if you look at James chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 14 and read down through 17. James chapter 2, 14 through 17. It says, What does the prophet, my brother, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute daily food, and one of you saith to them, Depart 
in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. If you look down at verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Amen. Nothing you can do will get you saved. After you're saved, God expects works. What kind of works? Good works. Amen. Fruit. How do you look and see what a person is? You become a fruit inspector. You see what kind of fruit they're bearing. So let your light shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven by your works. By your works. We have to produce things that people see that they see something different in us. We have to produce a works that are godliness. We have to reach out to the lost. We have to pray for the sick. We have to forgive those that despise us. That's hard to do, isn't it, huh? That's what he's talking about. There has to be some kind of works that, that are with that. And do his work. We have to do his works. And this church had his works. They did his works. They did not deny Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll end right there tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll pick up at verse 9 next week of chapter 3 of Revelation. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 11 through 13. Jeff. Also, with that, the works it's talking about is not just talking about going out and doing things, it's talking about showing the fruit of the Spirit. Yes. Well, he said it's not the, just the works of doing things, but it's allowing the fruit to show through you. As a Christian, that's a good uh, question or comment yet. As a Christian, okay, the fruits of the Spirit are something that should continue to grow and show in us. The nine fruits of the Spirit, okay? That's something that we grow in. That's uh, Galatians chapter 3, I believe. I have to go back. I think it's Galatians chapter 3. But it's the nine fruits of the Spirit, but those have to grow in us. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abide faithful, he cannot deny himself. We have to become the same kind of church that Philadelphia was, a war church. We have to bring forth Jesus Christ. Today, I think too many churches are taking Jesus Christ out of their church because I have even heard a pastor say that where I work at came up and said they don't stay at his church anymore because it causes too much controversy. I, it just broke my heart. That word, Jesus Christ, without it, we're nothing. We cannot take Jesus Christ out of the church. It cannot be done. He is the church. Any questions to that point? We'll pick up next week at Revelation 3, verse 9. And we'll start there.